Welcome everyone to today's devotion. We're in Mark chapter 10. Mark 10. So um, we are more than halfway through the book. And in fact, Lord willing, we will finish it next week. And then we only have one full book left before we're done with the entire New Testament. And that is the book of Acts. Let's pick up here in chapter 10, verse 1. Uh, Jesus is uh, uh, in Judea. And uh, the text says, as was his custom, he taught them. And it's in this context, um, what you're going to get in really the next few chapters is a series of challenges that Jesus has to, has to deal with. And in this one, um, the test has to do with divorce. Uh, this is in, uh, I, I know Matthew and Mark, and I believe it's in Luke as well. This question about divorce obviously is a big question, still remains a big question. So they ask, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? And then they explain, after Jesus asked them, um, what it is Moses said. And and their answer is, well, Moses said if we wrote a certificate of divorce, it's all good. You know, no-fault divorce, basically what what they're arguing here. And Jesus says, verse 5, that is there because of your hardness of heart. He wrote you this commandment. From the beginning of creation, however, God made them male and female. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. Right. So, so what Jesus does is, is he says, yes, the, the law may provide a provision for divorce. And um, Christianity um, uh, supports that position that in some instances, Jesus mentions adultery here. Uh, I, I think we can add abandonment and abuse for, for two other reasons. Um, but Jesus says here, the problem is, is... Um, you want there to be divorce, right? This is a serious problem, and it still is a problem. The point of marriage is to to be until death does us part. Um, So let death separate you, not man separate you. Um, And so, and one of those men could be you in the marriage itself, right? Your actions, your deeds, your words, abuse, whatever it, it might be. So Jesus says, look, sin separates holiness unites. So that is why we say that uh, couples don't fall out of love, they fall out of repentance. Where there is sin, it, it, it is a must that there be confession, forgiveness, repentance, and uh, reconciliation. Uh, if not, what you're going to get is division, or in this case, divorce. So Jesus is indicting them. Now, if, if we had time, we could explore uh, how, uh, how abusive uh, Pharisees were in using this certificate of, of divorce, um, and and they would, uh, uh, you know, divorce their wives for virtually any reason. Uh, many of them are quite quite ridiculous, and Jesus condemns them. This is the point of marriage is to stick together. And I would say in our culture, uh, with, with full of broken homes, we, we are trying to survive through the destruction of the home, and we're finding it virtually impossible. When fathers leave the home because of divorce, because of out-of-marriage uh, children, and, and because of adultery and, and everything else, what you then have to turn to is government, and government agencies have to step in, and, and government agencies, and government officials, and government leaders will never replace dad, will never replace mother, will never replace marriage, can't and will not. So what you get is chaos, what you get is the breakdown of society. And we think that somehow legislation will fix it. Good luck with that. You can reform every part of society, but unless you heal the home, uh, nothing is really going to be resolved. But in this context, we, we move again to a similar scene that we've seen before, uh, and that has to do with the children. Verse 13, they were bringing children to him. He might touch them, and the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw it, he was indignant and said to them, Let the children come to me. Do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. I, will, I just want to make two points. One is later, Jesus refers to the disciples as children. Right? So that's not an accident. But man, we've, t- we've talked about a parallel of this passage, so I don't want to spend forever on it. Um, but what I want to highlight is I don't think it's an accident. Mark juxtaposes Jesus teaching on marriage, and then he mentions children. You shouldn't have one without the other. With marriage comes children. Children should imply marriage. That is the bedrock institution of a society. You cannot replace that. Now, we know all of this, right? None of this is news. 
uh, but in a society that claims to believe in science, will not accept that the choices we make, the policies we support, and the moral chaos that we are going into damages children, damages the home, and thus damages society. We will not recognize that, and we're doing it to our own detriment. Well, then we get this story about the rich young ruler. Again, we're in the midst of a series of questions Jesus gets that often challenge or to be a challenge to him. And the question is, is one that every preacher wants to get there in verse 17. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus' answer is a surprising one. And he, he says, verse 19, you know, the commandments do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud on your father and mother. Now, you'll notice there that these come from the last um, six of the Ten Commandments. So I think we've talked about this before. The Ten Commandments are, are, are in two, two categories. Um, uh, laws regarding proper worship in relation to God and laws regarding proper relationship uh, with man. Right? So, so these are all taken from the latter. So don't murder, don't steal, don't bear false witness, don't commit adultery, stuff like that. Okay. Um, and so I think this is on purpose because Jesus is going to reveal, uh, Luke does the same thing with the Good Samaritan, which we're going to look at Sunday night. Um, Jesus is going to reveal to the man, you can claim you haven't done these things, but in reality, you haven't loved God, therefore you haven't loved your neighbor. And so the man says, I've, I've kept all these since my youth. Chances are, many watching this can probably brag about some of this. I've not committed adultery. I've not committed murder. I've not stolen, you know, a anything of value, right? I stole a candy bar one time. Um, so, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm in pretty good shape. Yeah, I've not bore false witness because I've never been on the witness stand. See, see how easy that is? So, yeah, I guess I'm okay. And then you add to it, this guy is an ethnic Jew. He must think, man, I, I am in good shape, keeping the law. Once a year, I go to church and the temple and make a sacrifice. So, you know, we, we'll call that Easter. And uh, so, you, you know, I, I have to be in really good shape. But Jesus, notice the language of verse 21, looking at him, loved him and said, you lack one thing, just one thing. Go sell all that you have and give it to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Come follow me. Notice there he's saying to the rich man, you will be richer in heaven than you could ever be here at earth. So why hold on to what it is you have here on earth? And I would say to the same thing, dear Christian, you have a kingdom that is far greater waiting for you in heaven than the one you could ever have here on earth. Why do we hold so fast to this kingdom, to this wealth, to these opportunities, to this career, to this job, to, the, to these relationships? One far better there. So why don't we make an idol out of them? What great insight Jesus gives us there. But notice verse 22, disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. Um, now, what did Jesus just do? He, he, he rightly understands you could divide the commandments into love God and love your neighbor. And the man claims to love his neighbor. The problem is he doesn't love his God. And it was as simple as saying, go sell everything you have and follow me. Do you really love God more than anything else? I was thinking, what would be a similar uh, example to this that would probably get me in trouble? But what do I care at this point? It would be Jesus saying something like, go, vote for the other party and come, come follow me. How many of us would say, well, I'm not going to listen to that guy's podcast no more. going to unfollow him on the Twitter. Because we often make idols out of lesser things. And thus we do not worship the greatest thing. And then Jesus then talking to the disciples says, how difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of heaven. That is exactly right. But I would add it's, it's, it's difficult for people who worship any other idol to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Because we think this idol will give us salvation and has given us salvation. What a great shame that is. In fact, Jesus says it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Let me just, just make a brief note here. I don't want to spend forever on it we, we've gone long enough already. People get crazy with this verse. I think we talked about this when we looked at Matthew's gospel. Or was it Luke? Um, so some will say uh, there was a gate called um, uh, the eye of the needle 
that in order for a camel to get through, had to get on his knees um, to get through it. Now that'll preach, right? That that'll preach. Problem is, you're just overcomplicating it. The eye of a needle is the part of the needle that the string goes through. So, can a camel go through an eye of a needle? No. That's Jesus' point. I don't understand why um, we need to overcomplicate this, right? But because that leads to the question. Who then can be saved? That's the question of the rich young ruler. Who then can be saved? Now, disciples are thinking, look, look, if, if salvation is, is harder than a camel going through an eye of a needle, then, then who can be saved? And Jesus' answer is so important. With man, it is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. That's the key to salvation. Salvation is not an entitlement. Salvation isn't something you earn. Salvation is a gift given by God by which he takes the old man and makes a new man. Redemption is creation. Thus, it must take the creator in order to give true redemption. What an important scene this is. Well, let us close this out. Jesus uh, foretells his death a third time in verses 32 to 34. Um, we, we've looked at these, so so I think we should interpret all these in light of the cross. Um you know, kingdom was the emphasis in the first uh, seven, eight chapters. Um, the cross is the emphasis of the last half. Um, and then we get this. Now, remember, Jesus uh, makes makes that prediction. And then we get this scene with James and John. Uh, Grant us to sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. They're completely missing the point. Jesus' command is pick up your cross and follow me. But where's Jesus going? He's going to Calvary where he's picking up his cross. And what do the disciples want for the second time in, in this book? Uh, to, to be the greatest in the kingdom. All they want is uh, to be known um, and to be loved and to be the center of, of everything. And so Jesus said to them, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with the baptisms which I am baptized? A clear reference to the cross, I believe. Verse 39, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism which I am baptized, you will be baptized. I think this is a prediction of, of what's coming for them. James is the first disciple to be uh, to die. John is the last. And they both suffer for the glory of God. But to sit in my right hand or left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. Jesus is, again, having to humbling them. Uh, I, I see some connection here, the third, predict, the third prediction of the first. Remember after the first prediction, Jesus says, ain't going to happen on my watch. Uh, and, and Jesus rebukes him. Why? Because his eyes are on the way of the cross. James and John are doing the same thing. They've taken their eyes off the way of the cross. The cross is the center of our theology and our Christian life. The cross must be it. Finally, we get Jesus healing Bartimaeus. I just emphasize this because this is the last major uh, uh, miracle uh, before the resurrection. This is the last event before the final week of Jesus. So tomorrow, Lord willing, will be in chapter uh, 11 and we'll be right into the last week of Jesus. So uh, about a third of Mark, a little over a third, is about the last week of Jesus. Remember, the Gospels are not biographies. They are Gospels. So the emphasis is on the death and resurrection of Jesus. Uh, notice Mark says this: the guy's name is Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus. Um, why give us that detail? I'll tell you why. Because Mark knew the guy and talked to him. Um, the, the Gospel writers would do this occasionally. Malchus is another good example. Mal he's the guy that uh, gets his ear cut off by Peter in the garden. Um, one Gospel, I think it's John, has his name, but the others don't. Why, why have that detail? He's an eyewitness. Uh, there are other examples. I, I did a whole sermon on it, bored everybody, but I, I find it fascinating. Uh, but notice what he says, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Do not forget the point of the gospel. Who is this Jesus? And no one other than the demonized have professed Jesus is the son of God. Blind Bartimaeus here has, has gotten the closest. Jesus is the son of David, thus Messiah. So Jesus heals him, go your way, your faith has made you well. And immediately there's that word, he recovered his sight and followed him on the way. And this is going to open up the door to when Jesus engages not just a blind beggar, but a blind nation. And we'll see it starting tomorrow. Hope to see you then.